Uh, now, over to a spotlight on our integration partners. So uh, just a refresher, we're going to be um, handing over to colleagues from Site, uh, Ex Libris, Springshare and EBSCO. And first off, I'm delighted to hand over to Josh. Uh, Josh is the founder and CEO of Site. And um, you know, not, to, uh, not to make his ears blush, but um, Site has really been doing incredible things uh, in its a uh, very small amount of time in existence. And if you, you take a look at what they're up to at the moment, it's incredibly impressive. So we're really proud to be partnering with them. They're one of the first uh, partners that we integrated with in this uh, new era with Lean Library Futures, and they're doing some super cool stuff. So um, I'm gonna hand over to Josh uh, for him to, to share his screen and present to you. No, oh, there we go. Cool. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, it's been exciting to, to listen in. Um, and thanks for having me uh, introduce Site. Uh, and so as, as Matt mentioned, my name is Josh Nicholson. My contact info information is shown on the slides. You can reach me at josh at site.ai, or you can tweet at us at Site. Um, and I think what we're doing is, you know, quite different uh, and has been very useful to students. And so we've seen a big uptake of students, uh, especially through TikTok. Uh, because I think our data is, is quite, uh, you know, different uh, and useful. And so I like to generally start by kind of pausing and, you know, we're talking about how do we get usage, how do we get access, all these things that we deal with as publishers or librarians or researchers. Uh, but I think, you know, it's nice to pause and say behind those publications, behind access, you know, is some really amazing content, right? It's given us the ability to, to better understand how we raise our children, to have virtual remote conferences like this, uh, life-saving vaccines, and I've been showing this slide now for over a year, and so it's been really amazing to say potentially one day, you know, COVID vaccines to now uh, having them. Uh, and so this is all powered by, you know, research and access and publishing, and, and uh, you know, I think it's, 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 it's not, you know, we, we get lost and bogged down in kind of the day-to-day -day of, of these smaller things, uh, but it's good to kind of acknowledge that. At the same time, uh, it's also good to acknowledge the challenges. And so that is there's a massive amount of content coming out now. Uh, there's been estimates that there's two papers per minute uh, being added to, to PubMed alone. And that estimate is probably small now at this point because that's a few years old. And if you look beyond biomedical literature, it's probably about double that. Uh, and then in addition to the massive amount of content coming out, there's been questions around how do I know what to trust? How do I know what has been tested? How do I know what is verifiable? And so what is reproducible? And I think those are, are interrelated. And, and really, that's at the heart of kind of, you know, what we built site for is to, to try to make research more reliable, interpretable, understandable. Um, and so I would encourage everyone to, to sign up at site uh, and, and test it out. You get two weeks free. Uh, and I think the browser extension through Lean Library is probably one of the best ways to use it because it takes the power of what we built and gives it directly to uh, the, the student or researcher. And so in essence, site is, you know, really trying to introduce the next generation of citations. So instead of showing, you know, just a list of titles uh, or a number showing how it's been cited, we show citation context. And so to date, we have analyzed and extracted 900 million citation statements from nearly all disciplines uh, uh, from 26 million full text articles. And this allows you to see how an article has been cited, has it been contrasted, has it been supported, uh, or to find information in a new way with a, a new search that we just released. And so the way that I like to show Sight is to show the world as it exists without Sight or to show it through the lens of Sight. And so say you come across this article uh, on Science Direct, you may have the Lean Library extension turned on, you'll see uh, our browser extension on the side. What this will show you is the number of times an article has been cited traditionally, uh, so the number of papers, and then the number of citation statements. So one paper can cite another paper multiple times and we will capture that. Uh, and, and we break it down by, does it provide supporting evidence? Does it just mention it or does it uh, uh, contrast it? And so in general, you know, when we look at a first, when we first look at a scientific article, we look at where is it published, who are the authors, and then some metrics. And I would say the metrics are used very superficially nowadays because it's just a number and a huge list, right? To open 52 different studies to see what they say about this uh, is, is a massive amount of work uh, and, and really not uh, doable, uh, unless you wanna spend you know, hours and hours just looking at how one article has been cited. And that's really kind of what we're trying to change, to change the dialogue from how many times has this been cited to how this has been cited. 
And so what you can do is click that browser extension and it'll bring you over to site. And up top, we'll have basically the same metadata as the version of record. And then really what is different, it's different uh, and, and quite unique to our platform is that we show the citation context. So here's an article from 2014 uh, we've extracted out the citation context, so the in-text citation from the discussion section of that article, and you can very easily read what does this citing article say about it. So instead of just saying this article cites it, maybe you'll open it, maybe you won't, you can now easily see this conversation happening amongst the literature. And I think that's really powerful because it allows students and researchers to quickly say, how has this study been received by others? Has it been supported? Has it been contrasted? You can filter by this uh, section which the citation appears. So maybe you want to look how it's been discussed and interpreted by other experts in the field. Uh, and I think that's very useful for students uh, better understanding these things beyond just looking at one individual article. And so this first one you know, says, our findings are in contrast to some preliminary findings that suggest that FHP youth have lower or equivalent, and then there's a target citation, white matter integrity compared to FHN youth. And so in a matter of a click, you're able to see that this article has been contrasted. You can search the citation context to further narrow it down. You can limit it to preprints or publications, and then also filter by discussion section. Uh, and so this has been applied not only to individual articles, but to universities. So if you wanna look up your university and see what is the most supported paper in there, who has the most publications, you can browse to our product and look at uh, affiliation dashboards, both for universities as well as companies. You can click on uh, the journals if you wanna see a journal dashboard to see the citation metrics related to brain research. People are generally linked where you'll be able to click their names. Uh, and really kind of everywhere citations you know, are applied today, we think we provide more nuance and more context. Uh, and that's exceedingly important when there's just so much information coming out, especially uh, information that's coming out in, in non-peer reviewed places like uh, uh, preprints. One thing though, that I also wanna highlight that we just released a few weeks ago, which I think is exceedingly powerful uh, and has really seen a big uptick in use, is the ability to not just search for individual articles and see how they've been cited, but to search our entire database. And the way that I kind of really think about this is I have a question, I want to see what does the scientific literature say about this? Um, and so in today's world, you might you know, look at PubMed or Google Scholar and you'll again be presented with a list of titles. Some of them you'll open and some of them you'll find the answer. But what if we could search the full text and see this information directly? And so we have introduced this ability to search our 900 million citation statements, again, coming from a diversity of different disciplines. So you can search things like Williamsburg rent rise, uh, the hypertension rate in Rohingya population, or even how Peppa Pig influences, you know, social uh, uh, interactions amongst children. And, and I think, you know, this is something I, I would encourage you to try to break because it's quite fun to see how diverse the literature is. Uh, you know, there's, there's incidences where sprinkled donuts have been mentioned and things like this. And so if you search something like Williamsburg rent rise, here's what you'll see. You'll see the citation context uh, and in this case, it shows, you know, uh, a recent, well, a semi-recent paper from 2009 showing rents on Bedford Avenue, which is one part of Williamsburg, increasing 224% between 2003 and 2007. And then another part showing uh, rent increasing by 158%. And so this is, you know, an answer uh, that, that I, I just got by this search. And so it's really a powerful way to get information retrieval. Uh, and I would say the closest thing to it uh, that we've seen so far is Google Scholar which does show some citation context, but they show fragmented sentences. And so it's really intended to show, this is how we match the search as opposed to utilizing these as, as an actual information source. And so what you can do here is, you know, not only see the source where this came from. So this uh, snippet of text comes from this article, but you can see that citation that it's referring to. And so you can hover over that and then open the full text there. You can filter by citation types, uh, you can also filter by where they appear. So say you want to better understand something, maybe you'll filter to citations in the introduction where someone might be defining something, or say you want to see if there's been crit critiques or discussion around a topic, maybe you'll filter to citations appearing in the discussion results section. And so we are actually expanding a lot of filters this week. Uh, so you'll be able to filter by people, affiliations, and really powerful way uh, of getting information, again, on almost anything, whether it's Williamsburg rent rise, you know, Rohing the, the hypertension rate in, in France or uh, 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 Bangladesh. Um, and, and this, you know, 
basically kind of makes the literature something like, I have a question, let me ask it and see what it says. And so a, a maybe more appealing uh, branding instead of citation st statement search would be, you know, here's 900 million expert uh, analyses, facts and figures uh, and opinions on, on nearly anything that, that uh, students, researchers, librarians, really anyone, even, you know, uh, non-scientists can utilize. And so with that, uh, I'll conclude, uh, but I would say, you know, if you have any questions or feedback, uh, please reach out to the Lean Library team or to us directly. Um, and it's really just a flip of the switch to turn on that browser extension. And I think, you know, give that kind of uh, ability to users to provide more context. So it's not just about supporting or contrasting, it's really about how has something uh, been cited. Um, so thanks again, uh, everyone. And uh, yeah, happy to answer questions later or, or now or whatever is appropriate. There's a, there's a question actually already, Josh, that would be great to, um, to put to you. And just to reassure the other speakers as well from our integration partners that we've left some buffer. Uh, so there's no need to, to worry about that. Um, the question was around any plans you have to integrate altmetric data into your... Into your we, we don't have plans to do that. Uh, I think in, in essence, we're kind of trying to work against that for some ways, right? So, you know, most metrics are looking at impact, uh, the number of citations, the number of tweets. And I think, you know, we want to move beyond just kind of the quantity and, and to provide more trustworthy, you know, uh, uh, analyses and interpretations and discussions and show how something has been cited. And so altmetrics, you know, to me, shows a lot of social media interactions, and I think that can be useful. Uh, but I think it can also incentivize research where you're trying to, you know, optimize for a high alt metric score. And so we don't have any uh, immediate plans to, to add that. Um, but, you know, I, I think we provide a different type of conversation. Altmetric alt captures the social media conversation as well as some news. We're capturing the conversation from scientific articles and going beyond just a list of titles. Um, and I think they're, they're both valuable. Thanks a lot, Josh. Um, so with that being said, I think we'll, um, well, thank you very much for, for your time and thank you for that uh, fascinating update as well. Um, so I'm going to hand over now uh, to Yisrael Kushar, who is Senior Director of Product Management at Ex Libris. Um, Lean Library has been working with Ex Libris um, pretty much since our inception uh, in late 2016, and it, always a key part of our access um, workflows. Uh, but this year, we've worked on new integrations, uh, particularly around the discovery service integrations, which uh, Israel is very kindly going to talk about. So Israel, I'll hand over to you. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Okay, so um, yeah, so um, thanks Matt and thanks for inviting me. Um, my name is Israel and I manage the product team um, for the discovery systems here at Exlibris. Um, I wanted to talk a few minutes about discovery in, in general and then a bit about um, you know, what, what it means um, to have this edition of, of uh, the new service from Lean Library. So really discovery, um, again, traditionally was about searching, right? So it's about searching and finding results or so flat search and, and results. Um, really all about the content that you, that you hold, the content that you subscribe to. Um, this again, this goes back really to the beginning of, of discovery. Um, you know, even beyond that to, to the OPEX and stuff, but really since discovery also bringing in um, all the electronic materials and, and article levels and, and so on. Um, as, as things evolved, really where, where we are now is going beyond just search and, and results. Really what we need to do is, at all what our goal is in discovery is really help the users find what they want similar to, to before, but finding might be done in, in different ways. Um, once they find it, obviously we need to get them the resource. If it's electronic, what's the best or digital, what's the best means to, to get those? Or if it's physical, how do you place a request and, and get those? Or again, any other different um, you know, methods that are coming to light, uh, you know, resource sharing, loaning, digital loaning and stuff like that. Um, and, and very, very important is really they need to enjoy the journey. Um, our users are very much impacted by what's happening around them. Um, their ecosystem in the academic library, um, it's um, e-commerce systems, it's social media, um, a lot of things that they're seeing out there, these are impacting what discovery uh, looks like and is going to, to, to look like. So again, um, the user experience keeps changing, again, based on what's happening um, around us in the world. 
Um, and it needs to be convenient. And last is also the context, um, the context of what they're requesting. So try to understand what they're about, but also moving kind of beyond what I started off with kind of the search and the results, there's different types of materials and different types of users and different types of contexts um, need a different type of um, addressing. So again, we're always going to have that search and results, but that's not um, the only way. So if we look at the discovery, um, for example, um, what I'm looking at here is um, different ways that we have sites um, looking at their special collections. Some of these special collections, um, again, in this case, most of these are digital, either born digital or digitized, but this could also be um, you know, just a collection that I decided to group together in a way, but looking at things um, again, through your discovery system, um, but again, not just, you know, the, the regular search and results, not just looking for everything, but really we have a unique uh, need for unique collections. In this case, it could be hierarchical. It could not necessarily be hierarchical, but just, you know, um, it's a curated um, set of special collections or a, spe a special collection in this case, um, photographs or uh, sketches or theses, or again, anything that's relevant that we've decided to put together and let the user um, search through these. Again, we'll need him to get to this page, but in here, it's not just about searching and, and finding. So again, kind of looking at something that is slightly different than, than just kind of the traditional search and, uh, and results. Another thing that is especially important um, this is you know two things one is the 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 size and the amounts of information out there are, are huge um, again just searching and finding results is is not enough we need to help people um seep through these results these millions and billions of of different results even in cases where the user does know what they're looking for so they they did their search they found what they're looking for but we want to again as part of that journey we want them to find more material and look at other materials and discover things that they didn't necessarily know when they came into their search. And this is really what they're used to and, and really coming to expect, um, again, based on what's happening out there in the rest of the world. And again, e-commerce, social media, and, and so on. They're, they're used to, again, searching for a movie that they're going to watch and again, find other, um, other movies that could be related to them, again, in different types of um, of relationships. It could be based on the same author director, if we go back to the movie um, analogy, um, as, and, and there's different types of relationships that we can pull and, and want to continue pulling in order to, um, to recommend um, to, to the user. So again, just a few examples here um, that, that we can talk about. Um, there's formal relationships, right? There's a book and, and a book chapter, right? We, we have the books in the catalog and we have you know, millions of book chapters in, in the central indexes. So again, link from one to another. I found one because I knew what I'm looking for, but let me find other books or other book chapters or a book review. These are formal relationships. Um, other informal relationships, again, more similar perhaps to, to some of the things that happened out there in, you know, in the internet world and, and, and e-commerce, you know, other users who use this also found that useful. Um, again, for example, here using BX or, or Synthetic Sunbound and, and there are other solutions as well. Um, and there's other things like looking at the curated relationships. This is related to this because someone decided, someone decided to put these together um, or again, piggybacking on, on you know, the, the, the session before me, um, some kind of citation trail. So I can, I can, I found this record. I can now find another record that, that's related because it was cited or used to cite um, another material. So different types of, of relationship. And really this is um, kind of where discovery is going and, and where if we want our users to, to continue and not just come and search and find, even if they know their record because they have an assignment, we want them to continue and know that they can come here and, and feel comfortable um, within this interface. Um, now, that all said, we need to engage the users where they are. So this was all great, assuming that we managed to get our system him. We want to hook, uh, we want to hook him in and, and reel him in, and, and we want him to, you know, to enjoy it so much and come back next time he has a question or, or research or an assignment to, to do. Um, but the fact is that not all users have come in, um, not all users even know to come in to, to the libraries, and we want to push the information out there. So here are things that we've been looking at um, at Xlibris again for 
um, you know, evolved over the past uh, 10 years in different stages, obviously, as technology changed and as um, the internet changed, but really push your information and your special collections primarily out there to, to the web. Um, again, there's different uh, technical elements that, that have evolved and continue to, to evolve in order to allow this. But this really is all about um, taking your special collections and, and pushing them out there. So when someone searches for them, um, or you know, depending on the keywords, and they might even be able to tell Google, or Google might know that they're associated with your institution or library, we will find them in, in Google. And again, and the user will then get the, the resource and, and be brought back into, um, into the library. So this is something that we've been doing um, for quite a while. Um, and and here I want to come back to um, to to the Lean Library and and the most recent um, development and feature that was come up. So um, what I what I looked about before was really more about pushing it to 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 Google. Um, you know, obviously users um, are often on on Google. That's kind of a, an often a default. Um, the other very common default, um, as we know, is, um, is is Google Scholar. So yes, the very basic of Google Scholar is Google Scholar understanding which institution the user is from, um, typically based on IP. Um, as of today, obviously less and less relevant. And the user still needed, if sitting at home, he needs to know how to go into Google Scholar, into the settings, and tell the system which library um, he's into. Um, and that's the first element I think that that Lean Library can can definitely um, help with. So again, getting that full text for those that kind of um, are a bit stumbling on on you know setting it up um, properly um, from the Google Scholar perspective. The other element, which I think is is very interesting and and kind of more um, completing what I had in the previous slide, is bringing the user back into the library. So um, again, this is an example here from a. Cardiff University, but basically searching Google Scholar um, and then you know taking that search and running it to um, to their institution, to their institution's uh, discovery, and offering to the user, you know, if you would have searched that system, you would have seen all of these. And and you know, some of these actually might be quite interesting to um, to what is looking after. Um, in some cases, um, the discovery is broader than than Google Scholar. It includes not only the same articles and books of Google Scholar, but other stuff as well. It might include um, more unique materials. But really, as opposed to what we were trying to do and um, pushing that data out to the user who's sitting at Google, here it's actually capturing this user who's using Google and you know, bringing him back into to the library. Um, in the end, I think, again, they, these two um, options complete each other. Um, and again, Google Scholar is obviously just um, an initial example, but this is something that definitely um, will, again, users that you know, aren't really um, knowledgeable about what the library is and what the library can offer and just go to Google Scholar, they never really understood that you know what the full text they're getting is because their institution subscribed to it. This really is bringing them back into the library um, and also exposing to them all the material that the library has that is not necessarily in in Google Scholar. Um, and with that, I think we'll conclude our quick spotlight. Um, unless there are any questions. Thanks so much, Israel. That was perfect. Um, there is a, a question actually. Yes, um, which is. Uh, how will this differ from CDI Quick Links? Okay, so CDI Quick Links is about, um, in, CDI Quick Links is really about searching in the Primo or Summon interface. So searching CDI, you know, you're searching the, the index that we have there. So your user is actually already in the library discovery system. They're in Primo, they're in Summon, they've searched something. And today, in order to get that, link they typically go through a link resolver menu that link resolver menu might have multiple options um, and from those options they typically get to a landing page on the vendor the provider site and then go in to a pdf or you know full text link there so there's quite a lot of links happening um, for the end user you need the end user to be patient to, to kind of go through all those steps to actually get to his holy grail of of the pdf that's what so quick links is really about giving a a link up front in, in addition to all that regular flow, but there'll be a link up front saying go directly to the PDF or the full text on you know an HTML page if it exists, and that will take you to the vendor 
direct, kind of skip all those uh, hops in the middle. Um, what we're talking about here is less about getting to the full text, but really about exposing them to the material. So it's more, uh, if, if the quick links is about the delivery of a resource once they found the resource, this is more around um, the, the discovery, the search of the resource. I'm still fishing, I'm still searching for what I want. I found results on, um, on Google Scholar, and this is offering me a whole parallel set of results that will then, again, bring me back into, um, into the library because that's actually where, again, this is kind of just a, a hint and um, kind of a beginning of the path to, to, you know, to get to those resources. Hope that answers it. That's perfect. Thanks so much, Israel. Um, yeah, and, it, and it's worth saying that um, this can be achieved on any website and domain as well. So the idea is that the user can enhance their discovery uh, workflow wherever that may be. If it's if it's on Google Scholar or Google or Wikipedia or a publisher site, wherever it may be, they can access uh, the, you know, the power of your library's discovery layer uh, there and then. Um, well, so thank you very much, Israel. We're going to move on now to Springshare. Um, and uh, just to, uh, by way of introduction, um, we're joined by Talia Richards, who's the marketing director at Springshare. And um, those of you that joined the, the very beginning of the festival will know that we have a partnership with Springshare that also has a unique uh, bundle, which we call Workflow for LibGuides. Um, and also that our partnership with Springshare began with LibGuides, but really, really we're looking um, at a deeper partnership across all parts of the, the Springshare portfolio. So uh, another um, of our partners that we're really proud to work with. And uh, I'm gonna hand over to Talia to take it away from him. Hi, thanks so much, Matt. You like took my intro. So <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. Um, hi everyone, I am Talia Richards from Springshare and I'm gonna say something pretty controversial, but I am having my first ever pumpkin spice coffee um, this morning. I know people are probably like, it's not fall yet, but I couldn't help myself. So uh, hopefully that doesn't start a debate on, on pumpkin spice in the chat. Um, so I am super excited to be talking to you today about Springshare's partnership with Lean Library. And um, as Matt mentioned, our first foray into this partnership um, is with LibGuides and the Lean Library workflow for LibGuides. But as Matt stated, we have huge plans for this partnership into the future, including integration of our LibAnswers product, our LibChat, um, and many, many others. So this partnership is really all about increasing usage of your LibGuides. Um, you, your fellow librarians, you spend a lot of time making these incredible LibGuides. And how often do you show them to a patron or a student and hear them say, oh my gosh, you know, where was this three months ago? Um, this could have helped me with that project I was working on or this research study that I was um, kicking off. And imagine being able to deliver that LibGuide kind of right at the point of need and have it magically appear right when and where they need it. You know, the right content to the right user at the right time. So at Utah State University, here's a chart of a roughly um, 100 day period year on year from, from January to April. And you can see that um, they had a Google, they had integrated the Lean Library workflow for LibGuides with their Google Scholar LibGuide. And they saw a 600% increase in usage in just five months on that one guide. Um, so really being able to, to see the return on their investment um, from this integration. So a little quickly about what, you know, tell them what you're gonna talk about and then talk about it and then wrap up what you just talked about. So we're gonna talk about the benefit of Springshare for Libraries, our integration with Lean Library Futures and any questions you might have. So first things first, Springshare for libraries. So our entire mission here at Springshare is to basically make you look like rock stars to your students and to your patrons. Um, we aim to do this by providing feature rich cloud-based software solutions at a really incredibly affordable price. Um, we wanna make it as easy as possible for you to engage with your patrons, your students, whether that's through a LibGuide, a LibChat, 
or a LibCal event. And hopefully, um, I'm assuming everybody here has heard of LibGuides, but if you haven't, um, I'll just state that a LibGuide is basically an online pathfinder that allows you to embed resources like books, databases, websites on specific topics or even really granular on specific, you know, courses to essentially provide point of need um, reference services. Another kind of mission of SpringShare is we, we literally just want to make your job easier. Um, a good percentage of Springies, myself included, and that's what we call ourselves, Springies, um, used to be librarians um, and still are librarians, MLIS librarians. Um, I was an academic librarian for six years and almost everyone on our community support and training team um, were librarians as well from academic, public and other. And so we know the struggles you're facing um, in gathering, uh, creating these materials, sharing them with patrons, making sure they're getting used and then analyzing those you know, resources, gathering analytics and usage statistics, which is, you know, why we try to make all of our tools as easy to use as possible, to have incredibly robust usage statistics that are downloadable. Um, we know how annoying it is to do some kind of back-end work, like scheduling staffers and work-study students for working around the library, um, you know, and which is why we've created some back-end tools, like analytics tools, as well as a staffing tool to kind of take that um, annoyance, you know, and flick it off your desk. Um, bottom line, the, the point of, of, of my slide here is that we here at SpringShare are you. Um, we literally are and were and, you know, continue to be librarians. We know what challenges you face. Um, we face them too. And so we want to make your work life even just, you know, one smidge percent easier possible. So let's talk about our partnership with Lean Library. We are really excited to partner with Lean Library to make it easier than ever to bring your SpringShare tools right at the point of need, kind of magically via the browser plugin. So we've started with LibGuides. We're already seeing an absolutely tremendous response to this integration. And we'll see how it actually works in a little bit. But basically, your patrons um, download the plugin, and when they navigate to a specific web page, the plugin identifies where they are and delivers up the right LibGuide for them. This is called Workflow for LibGuides. So it works if you're both a LibGuides or LibGuides CMS subscriber, and it essentially allows you to push your LibGuides content to them rather than waiting for them to passively come to your website and find it themselves, which of course we know that that takes knowledge of and will too, <laughs> you know, to find. So LibGuides are a really important part of, of patron support. Um, at Utah State University, they have 493 LibGuides. Um, on average, our institutions create hundreds and hundreds of LibGuides. We don't believe in limits. Um, we even have a university, Walden State uh, University, that has created over 3,000 LibGuides. Um, these guides represent significant time, effort, and skill not just in creating them, but also maintaining them, right? 493 LibGuides at Utah State have to be periodically reviewed and maintained. So you're talking a lot of effort, time, money, resources um, going into creating this content. They cover at Utah State pretty much everything from Google Scholar to writing guides for engineers. So really high level stuff to really granular stuff. And, um, the, the, this content lives outside the systems where patrons are working. So it lives in the LibGuide system, which is great, but it lives outside of the system that patrons tend to be working in. And they have to know that it exists and they have to know where to find it and they have to know and have the will and drive to go looking for it. Um, and so if a patron is working inside Google Scholar, they want help on how to use Google Scholar. How do I make use of advanced search? Am I even in the right spot? Um, you know, but I'm gonna go to Google Scholar because nobody told me where to really start my research. I'm an incoming freshman. I have no idea how to, you know, that there is a library and that the library pays for these resources. So I'm just gonna start here at Google Scholar. 
And imagine being able to deliver a resource to them inside that workflow that doesn't interrupt their workflow and it reduces the barrier, it reduces the friction while increasing the return on the investment on, on your significant time. As this really wonderful article in reference and service, reference and user services quarterly from 2017 by Elizabeth Germain um, wrote that ensuring that libguides are effective requires the delivery of information and resources with learners at their point of need. So the right message to the right user, and this is key at the right time. So let's take a look at what this looks like with a little video here. Um, and let's see a recorded demonstration of the integration. It's like I said, it's highly likely that incoming freshmen will start at Google Scholar because that's all they know. So they're here and you want to make sure that they're getting access to the resources. They go ahead and click on that. They see a training button and up pops the LibGuide that allows the users to quickly dip into that LibGuide for information about how to use Google Scholar and use it alongside their research without having to navigate away. It also allows you to share resources that you're paying for when they're in Google Scholar and might not know about it. So it's not just about providing you know, the LibGuide at the point of need, but also saying, hey, maybe you shouldn't be here. Maybe you should be, um, you know, you're here in Google Scholar and that's fine, but here are some other resources that might be better for you. And then of course they can close the item, mark it as read, and then move on to continue doing what they, what they prefer to do. So how do you set this up? Oop, I hit the button. There we go. So how do you set this up? <clears throat> Step one, you have to connect your LibGuides to your uh, lead library features Lean Library Workflow for LibGuides. So you need to activate your preferred uh, LibGuides in the patrons workflow. And the first step obviously is to enable them. So basically making the two systems talk to each other. So we're, we're getting them to talk to each other and shake digital hands, so to speak. Then mm -hmm. next up is selecting the guides that you'd like to import and activate to be surfaced on your patrons workflows. Not every LibGuide should be imported. Um, you might use your LibGuide system to have a staff intranet. A lot of folks you do that. And if that's the case, you probably don't want to import your staff intranet guides. I know for a fact that there, are, there are a few academic institutions that have LibGuides called dealing with problem faculty, which I think is hysterical. Probably don't want to import those, right? Those are for kind of internal purposes only. So this is a really key step, choosing which content you'd like to import and 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 having that control. Next up is saying which assets, which location should be connected to the LibGuide, right? So for my statistics LibGuide over here, I might want it to be surfaced whenever a student visits Data Planet or Statistical Abstracts of the United States, right? So they're visiting Data Planet, they're confused, here's some statistical help while you're in this resource. This is also a good time to kind of think outside the box. Consider, if you haven't, consider building libguides on fake news or fighting disinformation or, you know, busting COVID myths, for example, and adding those to be surfaced on websites that you know spread misinformation. Or, you know, if you built a libguide on racial justice and sharing that on websites that um, are consistent with that um, movement. Here's another good example. Do you have a LibGuide on setting up Facebook privacy? We all know that, that patrons and students do not know how to set that up. And wouldn't it be great to uh, have that appear when they visit Facebook so that they know, oh, here's how I can adjust my privacy settings so I'm not sharing this information, this private information about myself with the whole World Wide Web and have it follow me forever. So um, it's more than just sharing institutional resources, but providing actually in-context help that they, they might um, not be you know, aware of and, and learn how to do. So when we're, when we're kind of circling back here to the LibGuides usage increase at Utah, Utah State, um, in their one guide, their Google Scholar LibGuide, um, by, and you can see the before in the blue and the uh, after in the red, 
by delivering library support to their users at point of need, they saw a 600% increase in a year over year uh, comparison um, in just four months. So in a four month time period from January to April in I believe 2019 to, to 2020, or no, I'm sorry, 2020 to 2020, 2021, this year, they saw a 600% increase. So it works. They got more hits on their guide, increasing the usage, and therefore um, increasing the return on their investment. So I'm going to open it up to any questions anybody might have. Um, thank you so much, Talia. So there is a question, and actually Daniel and I, uh, our head of product, were just conferring on it. Uh, so we thought we would address that because it's um, to do with the future plans at Springshare and uh, also will help us uh, with time. Just um, uh, we have uh, one more presentation to come uh, from EBSCO, but we've, we've still got plenty of time, but uh, we thought we would address this one very quickly. Um, so the question was around um, plans to integrate with LibAnswers FAQ. Um, and if you saw a little bit of the Lean Library Futures presentation earlier, you'd have seen our um, Lib chat, library chat integration that we're working on at the moment, which will launch, launch soon. And as a part of that, we are actually able to, um, to bring in uh, some of the offline uh, FAQ um, responses, um, but we would be keen also to, to work on the other parts of FAQ as well. And that will be part of our ongoing roadmap. So if that, if that particular um, questioner wants to reach out to us uh, after, that would be great as well. Um, and I think that, yeah, so thank you again. Thank you very much, Talia. That was, that was fantastic. A great overview. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm very delighted now to, uh, to hand over to Becky Cottrell, uh, VP of Product Management at EBSCO. Um, so with EBSCO, um, again, we've been working with EBSCO really since Lean Library's early days, uh, supporting those access pain points. Um, and this year we've been working on a discovery service uh, integration with them. We're also working with them on content integrations in the future. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a really fantastic partnership from us. We've learned a lot. And um, if, you, if you want to hear more about this as well after Becky's presentation, we do have some case studies and some in-depth webinars as well. Um, but I will hand over to Becky to, to give you a little bit of a spotlight. Thanks so much, Becky. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. Hope you can all hear me. Let me get my screen share started here. See if we can get this working. Okay. I think we're ready to go. Let me know if there's any issues with the slides as we get going. So first, I just want to say thank you to Matt and the other folks at Lean Library. Um, as he mentioned, we've been working together since fairly the, the, the early days. Um, thoroughly enjoyed the partnership. I also wanted to, to say that I really enjoyed um, the previous presentations today. It's been great listening to um, all the different ideas and concepts and excitement around integration with Lean Library Futures and how we can enable patrons and end users to get access to the content that they need for this amazing research that really does impact people's lives on a daily basis. Um, and Talia, I, I'm not having a pumpkin spice latte today, but I'm also an early adopter of, of all things fall related. Pumpkin bread and pumpkin pancakes have already been made in our house. So I'm with you on an early adoption of fall. Um, my name is Becky Cottrell. I am a vice president here with the product management team um, focused on a variety of our, our products, primarily EBSCO Discovery Service. And I'm here to speak with you today about our integration with Lean Library Futures. So we're gonna follow a similar agenda that you've seen with the other presentations today. Um, what is EBSCO Discovery Service? What is the power of EBSCO Discovery Service? why an integration with Lean Library Futures, and then open it up for questions. So the power of EDS, right? We, we've been talking a lot about discovery services. So what is EBSCO's discovery service? Well, it's a single search box that gives researchers, patrons, end users access to 
all the variety of content. You've heard the other panelists speak about it today. We're talking about databases, catalogs, journals, e-journals, books, e-books, e IRs, custom collections. We could go on and on about the different type of content that you need to expose and provide access to, to your researchers, to your patrons. EDS has more, almost three and a half billion searchable records, content from over 20,000 publishers, and that includes over 3,000 open access publishers. We know how much energy and time each of you puts in to configuring the product experience, not only to ensure that the content that you're subscribing to, that you pay for, that you work very hard to make sure that you're constantly dwindling budgets, that you're covering the content that your faculty expects you to cover for their students and for your researcher needs. You're expecting a powerful discovery service that can provide the best access to that content for your researchers. That's the power of the EDS search engine. It's built differently. We leverage the power of subject indexing, the SORI user's natural language, enhanced subject precision, the idea is we want to make sure that we're getting users, that we understand the intent of their searching, and we get users to the content they need to complete their research. So I've been blessed to be with EBSCO for a little over 10 years now. And I'm sure many of you who are on the call have been in the industry, uh, in or around the industry, for at least that period of time, and, and many of you for much longer. And I think we would all agree that we could name a few constants in that time period, and we could name a variety of evolutions um, in that time period. Um, we've heard different panelists today talk about some of those evolutions. You know, you think about if you were to look back 10 years ago to the usage of print content as compared to e-resource content, print was still winning and you know, we've gone way in the opposite direction. Even prior to the pandemic, we had gone in the opposite direction and the pandemic has just increased e-resources taking over that um, ability to really get the content to the users wherever they may be. I would say one of the content, one of the constants though, is that researchers need and expect seamless access to content when they need it, where they need it, and how they want to access it. That's been a con constant. Um, 10 years ago, 10 years from now, that will be a constant. Now, the thing that's really changed is when, where, and how the users expect to get access to that content. Used to be you had to go physically to the library, or you had to at least log in to the library's website and start your search there. We've seen many other panelists talk today about, you know, users don't necessarily, in fact, most, more often than not, users will not start their search experience in your library's website or in your discovery service that you've spent time configuring and customizing and providing access to all the content that you know would be meaningful and helpful to their research experience. So how do we make sure that we're taking advantage of all the work that you've done to configure your discovery service, to purchase the content that the faculty needs and expects to have available to researchers, but provide it in a way that users can get quick, seamless access to it. And that's really where these, these things come together. EDS integration with Clean Library Futures. And, and this is a, a perfect quote from the Future of Academic Libraries report. Libraries should surface content and services in the places where users actually are Rather than we all, rather than where we would all like for them to be, which is in the library. So, the integration of EBSCO's discovery service with Lean Library Futures browser extension enables the ability to surface the best library search results alongside Google Google Scholar searches, which enables end users to get seamless access to the article results that they need and the best results because you're relying on discovery service power and robustness of search and search result availability, but it also increases the availability and usage 
of your library's discovery service, again, that you spend all that time configuring and making sure that it's an environment in which researchers can really get the work done they need to get done. And it validates the content that you're spending your budget and you're going every year back to, to, to fight for that budget for the content that your faculty expects to have available. So it's a win-win situation when you integrate with the library, Lean Library Futures Act. So here's a little video, just similar to what you've seen in, with the other panelists. If I'm in Google Scholar, I do a search for gold. You'll see that I, as a user, am affiliated with Bellevue University here. I'm gonna see over here, oh, I can see my discovery um, results right here. That top result is actually the one I wanted to go look at. So I can click on that top result and be taken directly, seamless authentication, directly to that detail record for that top result item, which is the one I was looking for. Or maybe I'm not sure if that top result list item is the one I'm looking for. I can still get access and benefit from the EDS robust search engine by going right to, right to, if I get to the right page here, right to the full set of search results. I've, I've driven the user back to the library website, back to the discovery service that you've taken the time to configure and, and expose to your users in the format that you feel is best for them to complete their research. They now can take full advantage of all the source types and limiters and facets and everything to get full text access to the actual articles and results that will benefit their research but they were able to do it by starting their research where they're comfortable. So I just wanna thank you guys today. That's really the end of, of my presentation. Um, thank you, Matt, again, and thanks to the other panelists. I've really enjoyed the conversation today. Thank you so much, Becky, that was fantastic. Um, just see if anyone has any questions. Um, Looks like not. Just to say that um, um, Becky and uh, myself will also be presenting uh, at Charleston. We'll be going through a, a case study there, um, and so and hopefully we'll have more case studies through the year as well. So you'll be able to see how libraries have implemented this too. Looking forward to that, Matt. Likewise, likewise. Thank you so much. Well, I think um, 